the tone, 8 o'clock. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you an unusual true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another true story about real people on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight, we're going to take you back to those wild and wonderful days on the western frontiers of America almost a hundred years ago. Back to Colorado when Denver was a young boom town. In those days, killing a man wasn't much of a crime, apparently. <laughs> but when, uh, but, well, wait now, wait, wait a minute. That's, that's the true story we're going to tell you tonight as we honor William Newton Byers, the two-gun editor of the Rocky Mountain News. Now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. One of the particular joys of Christmas is sending and receiving Christmas cards. While the pleasure Christmas cards bring can never be measured, isn't it good to know that Hallmark cards are priced the same this year as they were last year, and the year before, and the year before that? And that the quality of Hallmark cards has constantly improved throughout the years? Yes, today, just as for many Christmas seasons, that Hallmark on the back of your card is looked for and welcomed. It tells your friends, you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Julius Caesar with an all-star cast, including Marlon Brando, James Mason, John Gielgud, and Louis Calhoun. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. <laughs> Did you ever look at an old map of the Rocky Mountains <laughs> and read the names of those wonderful towns? Names like Mystic and Whoop Up, Sunbeam and Crook, Headstrong and Last Chance. And, and if the map was a new one, it, it might show for the first time a young boom town just ten months old then. This town's name was Denver. <laughs> yeah, Denver, 1859. And the gold seekers are pouring in, greedy men lusting for gold. Among them, in strange contrast, is a mild-eyed man named William Newton Byers and his worried wife. Oh, goodness, William, what was that? In target practice, my dear. Oh, what ruffians. Are there no laws in this place? Frontier life, my dear. First the deeds, then the laws. Here's the blacksmith shop that man told us about. Oh, yes. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Pollock? That's me, Noisy Tom Pollock, they call me. What can I do for you? Well, my, na my, na my name is Byers, Mr. Pollock. Uh, William Newton Byers. Uh, this is Mrs. Byers? How do you do, ma'am? How do you do? Uh, we have only this moment arrived in Denver, Mr. Pollock. Well, welcome, welcome. Only you shouldn't have brung the lady. Well, a number of persons have uh, recommended you as being a resourceful person, the proper sort of person to come to for information. Well, what do you want to know? Name it. <laughs> Well, on the outskirts of town, my partner, Mr. Gibson, is waiting with our wagon, a printing press, paper, and a quantity of type. You're going to start a newspaper? That uh, is our intention, to publish the first newspaper in the Rocky Mountains. Well, I'll be a ding-dong son of a gun. Uh, we need to find a room. Uh, rooms are scarce, ma'am. And you really shouldn't have come, ma'am. Oh, but I can defend myself, if that's what you mean. Well, I'm not... Oh, no, ma'am, don't point that derringer at me, ma'am. William is armed, too. William, show Mr. Pollock your new picture. I just soon have to watch how you handle them things. Oh, but uh, we are both quite skilled, Mr. Pollock. We, uh, 
We practiced on the trail. Hey, you did, huh? Yes, we did. Uh, put away your weapon, my dear. Yeah. So you see, Mr. Pollock, your warnings are quite unnecessary. Now then, where can we find a room? A room? Well, you got spirit, ma'am. Real spirit. A room. Well, do you want it for sleeping or working purposes? Well, I fear the one must serve duly until we have made a success of our venture. Oh, busted, huh? Well, naturally, we will repay you for your aid. Oh, I don't want no money. Oh, but I insist. No, no. Tell you what. You give me just one free ad in your first edition, that's all. Well, I'm delighted. <laughs> Joey, mind the shop. Now, you folks come on with me. I got just the place in mind. You better wait here by the door, ma'am. Alone? I should see, no. Uh, all right, ma'am. Hey, cannibal, look at the lady. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, you beat me. All right, Gordon, cannibal. See you enough of that. Hey, Uncle Dick. Come in. He owns a room I had in mind. And is he the proprietor of this establishment? Yeah. Goodness. What on earth are these men drinking? Well, they call it Tow's Lightning, ma'am. I couldn't rightly say what it is. Seems effective, though. Yeah, it's powerful stuff. Powerful. Uh, what, what, what's up, Tom? Oh, oh, Dick Wooten, this here's William Byers. Uh, just arrived. And Mrs. Byers. Oh, you shouldn't have come, ma'am. Oh, no, don't worry, Uncle Dick. The lady's armed for bear. <laughs> it, what I wondered was, next to the courtroom upstairs, that lawyer's office still empty. It is. Yeah, well, I want you to let it to Mr. Byers here. He's fixing to publish the first newspaper in these parts. Huh? Sure, follow me. <laughs> I'll uh, show you the room, but I don't know about you publishing the first newspaper. A couple of fellas over the next block are fixing to put out a paper, calling it the Cherry Creek Pioneer. Oh, dear. Hmm? What's uh, holding them up? Advertising. At least that's what I heard. They don't want to publish until it's sold enough advertising. Hmm. Well, that's the least of our problems. Well, you mean you already got some advertising? Well, of course. I've been selling space ever since I left Kansas City. Ah, uh, you hear that, Uncle Dick? Yeah. Well, this here's the room. It's got a desk and a couch. Window there's real glass. And you want news, courtroom's right down the hall. We'll take it. Done. Elizabeth, you ride down Mr. Pollock's side while I go get Mr. Gibson in the wagon. Hey, you figure to get your paper out of four of those other fellas, huh? Within 24 hours, Mr. Pollock. Well, then I tell you what. In addition to that one free ad I got coming, I want to buy some others. Well, if you'll just dictate them to me. Yes, ma'am. Oh, incidentally, you got a name picked out. We have? We're planning to call it the Rocky Mountain News. What about stories? Oh, William has been collecting mining news from the people we met on our way into town. Yes, and I dare say there are social events and uh, political announcements and... Uh, yes. There was a near murder in the street as we arrived. The aggressor, I believe you hailed him downstairs in the bar. Uh, was his name uh, Gordon? Jim Gordon? You better not print that one, Mr. Byers. Oh, why not, Mr. Bouton? Well, I... Uh, news, you know. Indeed, rather an exciting story. I saw part of it with my own eyes. Hey, you listen, Uncle Dick here. He knows what he's talking about. Gentlemen, my creed is a free press and an informed public. My creed and my motto. And I stand by it. Now, if you'll excuse me. Headstrong. Yeah. Gentlemen, Mr. Byers can be firm. Very firm. You'll see. Oh, you'd be surprised how many firm people there is in this town, Miss Byers. Your advertisement? My advertisement. Oh, yeah, yeah. For sale, two barrels of best Magnolia whiskey. See Thomas Pollock. Now, here's another. Blacksmith work on the... By midnight, they had their Washington hand press set up cases distributed, and were busy setting type. And just 28 hours from the time he arrived in Denver, William Newton Byers had the first copy of the Rocky Mountain News on the streets. And in Uncle Dick Wooten's bar, there was real excitement. You better see what's here in the oh, All right, all right, now don't push. It's 25 cents the copy, and there's enough for all. Yeah. Well, looky here, lawless hell 
performance rampant in Denver. Oh, Jim, you got your name in the paper. Don't mean nothing, Phil. <laughs> Jim Gordon's a scare. Yeah, what's the matter, Jim? You scared this fella, Byers? No, I'm generous. I give him this one chance. <laughs> yeah, sure. Only, how about next time? Next time, I shoot him. See, cannibal? Yeah. Yeah, I see. So, come on, let's get a belt of that Taos lightning. Huh? One chance, see? And then, bang. Like that. This here's a man's town, and no nosy little editor's gonna change it. Just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Have you discovered that you often know who sent a certain Christmas card even before you glance at the name inside? Something about the color or design or the gaiety or formality of the greeting you have in hand seems to say, this is from the Johnsons, as just like their farm in New England. Or, I'll bet Janet shows this card, she loves everything in shades of blue. It's true that a Christmas card almost always reveals the taste of the person who sends it, and that is as it should be. For nothing you give your friends all during the year expresses your feeling of warmth and love so completely. Now, a pleasant way to find that perfect card for you or your family is to select from the Hallmark Christmas card albums. You'll find the collection is widely varied and that Hallmark cards are the ones you'll be proud to have imprinted with your name. And here's a wonderful plus. That hallmark on the back of every card you mail gives added meaning to your message because it tells your friends instantly you cared enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of William Newton Byers. printing press and his pearl-handled revolvers into the rough, tough Denver mining camp and founded the Rocky Mountain News. In a region where murder was commonplace and larceny legion, his lone voice spoke out for law and order. Now, Denver was divided in those days by Cherry Creek, split down the middle, one side Denver, the other side Auraria, and there was great rivalry. Byers and his partner, Gibson, built their office on stilts right in the middle of the shallow creek. One day, while they were at this, they received a visitor. Hey, Gibby. Yeah? Hand me the draw sheet, will you? Here you are, Billy. Yeah. Well, look yonder, huh? Editor Byers, I believe? Yes. McCart, Professor O.J. Goldrick, A.B., M.A., L.L.D. Oh, how do you do, uh, this is my partner, Mr. Gibson. What can we do for you, Professor? It strikes me your paper is sadly in need of prose. That is to say, of prose which elevates the psyche of the reader. Uh, oh, do I offend? Oh, go right ahead. And I am therefore offering me services as reporter for your journal. Reporter? <laughs> Billy, what do you think? Uh, tell me, Professor, can you dig post holes? I can indeed. Shingle the roof? With the best. And the gun? I've had certain experience. And take off those yellow gloves, Professor Goldrick. You are now a reporter on the Rocky Mountain News. Are we ready, Gibby? We are. Issue number five is ready to print. <laughs> you know, I do like my little piece on floral arrangement. It has rather a sprightly ring, don't you think? Uh, you shouldn't have put in about the Edelweiss, Professor. Only confuse these hard rock miners. <laughs> hey, Billy! Hey, noisy Tom. How are you, sir? You got another ad, Billy? Oh, it'll have to wait till next week, Tom. Oh, now, Billy. I'm sorry. Well, well suppose, uh, like last week, I had a real good story. Well... If you have a story that'll warrant our breaking up the front page, you can put in your ad. I got one. It's about that crazy Jim Gordon. Oh, tales of murder are humdrum in this area, Tom. You know that. No one wants to read of a murder when he can put his head out of the window and see one. Well, that's so, that's so. But this time, he's committed a crime so heinous that my blood boils when I think of it. Well, pray, you sedate my good man. Yes, what'd he do? That no good 
polecat that mangy mouth cutthroat got drunk this morning and shot the bartender in the elephant corral. Well, now, I don't blame him. Poison their serving. Uh, quiet, Gibby. Tom, is that all? It is not. Then what he done, he broke out all the windows at Miss Annie Pearl's boarding house. Why, I've done that myself. It's really rather amusing, you know, <laughs> under certain circumstances. Well, hold on, Professor. I'm coming to the real one now. No, oh, sorry. He went reeling out into the street, a gun in each hand. Yonder come Thad Wilson with his good hound dog on a rope. And he shot Thaddens? No, sir. He shot the dog. The swine. That is a story. Gibby, break up the front page. Yeah, you can just read what it says here in the paper. Right over here. It says, this fiend in human form, this slayer of the, the innocent, must be brought to justice. Yeah. Nor all the tears of the little children with whom that faithful canine was wont to romp shall bring his merry bay, his wagging tail, among us again. That's enough. That's enough, I say. I give that buyers this chance, what'd he do? He told the truth, and I agree with him. Right. Right. Jim Gordon, you ain't fitting to associate with decent fellas like us. That's right. That's right. That's right. Decent. Maybe you'd like me to tell these men why you was nicknamed the cannibal. Well, at least I never shot no poor little old defenseless dog. Hey, Jimmy. What? What are we waiting for, huh? Let's go shoot us an editor. <laughs> yeah. I'm sort of worried, Billy. Suppose you worry about next week's story. Uh, maybe instead of just that boardwalk, we ought to, ought to put in a drawbridge or something. <laughs> My dear Gibson, the life of extreme exigency has impressed one great Christian precept upon this hard-foot soul. Yeah, what's that, Professor? The evil of the day is sufficient unto itself, Gibson. And furthermore... Look out! Look out! Professor, are you hurt bad? In the popular literature of the frontier, I am suffering but a scratch. Personally, may I observe that I've been considerably yeah, Now, your pain. shoulder. Your shoulder, you're bleeding. Well, you're very clever to notice that, Gibson. You got your gun? You got your gun there, Gibson? Yes, got it here, right under the press. All right. Professor, take one of my pistols. Thank you. Well, you see them? No. All right, Byers. Come on out. Hey, that must be Jim Gordon. Keep down, Gibby. Yeah. Well, now, what do we do? Well, let's see. There's the trap door. Suppose I go down into the stream and work around to the bank while you two keep them occupied. All right, Billy. Be careful, will you? I intend to. shoot a man whilst he was looking you in the eye. Don't, don't make a move. I'm going to walk past you, Byers. I know you won't shoot me. You're too civilized, too decent. You see? Now I'm passing you. Shoot him, will you? You want a gunfight? Come around to the street for two minutes, Byers. Fair and square. All right? I'll be going now, Byers. In the name of heaven, William, why didn't you do it? There's, there's been enough killing in this town, Professor. Well, what are you going to do? Let him get away with it? Give me my other gun. Here. Well, where are you going, William? 
I'm going to arrest Gordon. Arrest him? Yes. I'm a citizen of this town, Professor. And it's my duty to see him brought to trial for murder. He'll kill you, will you? We shall see. Looking for me? What? Stand nice and still, newsman. Feel him? Two guns right in your back. Fair and square, eh? Oh, that stuff, that's for nice, high-minded literary types like you. Now, me, I'm just a fiend. Wasn't that what you said in your paper? A fiend? What are you going to do? I'm going to blow your head off. <laughs> yeah, that'll teach him a lesson. The folks around here is getting tired of all this lawlessness. Well, I... I, thank you, Tom. Uh, man's mouth, Kerr. Gardner killed our only editor. William, are you all right, William? Yes, Professor. Thanks to Tom here and, and his marksmanship. Oh. oh. My. William, what, what happened? Uh, oh. Yes, I, I think things are going to be different from now on. You bet, Billy. Now, I want to take out an ad. Denver needs a sheriff. Elect Tom Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> an excellent idea, Noisy Tom. Uh, better yet, I'll make it an editorial. Front page. Now you're <laughs> talking. It's time this town grown up. Cherry Creek! Hello? Uh, Cherry Creek! What's that? Cherry Creek! There's a consigned wall of water coming down it like a steam locomotive. Oh, my sakes, look at it. The press! There goes the office. Man, look at her go! The greatest news story we've ever had. And we have nothing to print it on. A flash flood originating in the mountains swept down the little creek and wiped out the shack on stilts, the home of the Rocky Mountain News. <laughs> I have a precious old copy of the paper here. Tells about that flood. And the byline actually reads, O.J. Goldrick. At about the hour of four o'clock of Thursday, the 19th instant, a frightful phenomenon sounded in the distance, and a shocking calamity presently charged upon us. Hark! What and where is this, a torrent or a tornado? These were the questions soliloquized and spoken one to the other. Alas, and wonderful to behold, it was the water engine of death dragging its destroying train of maddened waves. <laughs> To see men on their knees panning for gold was not an uncommon sight in those days. And for weeks after the flash flood hit Cherry Creek, you could see two men panning the sands below the former site of the Rocky Mountain office. But not for gold, but for the precious newspaper type. Uh, William. Huh? Uh, I've got another letter E. Huh? Lower case or upper case, Professor? Uh, lower. Oh. Now keep trying. It's the upper case we need. For the headlines, you know. <laughs> William Newton Byers eventually did get his press reassembled and the Rocky Mountain News rolled out. And it's still rolling out to this day. Yes, sir. One of the finest papers in the West, or anywhere. In one of the great cities of the West. Oh, yes, the rough, tough mining camps of Denver and Auraria finally merged, becoming the just, law-abiding, and fine, decent place to live this Denver today. Thanks to the courage and determination of the original two-gun editor of the Rocky Mountain News, William Newton Byers. Next 
Next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, we have for you the incredible story of Squanto the Cockney Indian. Yep, that's what I said, the Cockney Indian. What an extraordinary man he was. He was a chief of the Portucket tribe who amazed the Mayflower pilgrims by greeting them in their own English language when they landed at Plymouth Rock. <laughs> More about Squanto in a minute. But here, Frank Goss, he's been eavesdropping again, and he wants to tell you about a little conversation he snooped in on while riding in a bus the other day. Well, today I overheard two women chatting on the bus about the Christmas shopping they were going to do. And one of them said, we're getting ready for our gift wrapping party. It's becoming a custom at our house. This sounds like a good idea to me because half the fun of giving your Christmas gifts is wrapping them, especially if you get your papers and trimmings well in advance. And one glance at the new matched Hallmark gift wraps will convince you there's a pattern and color to please everyone you know. You see, all year long, the Hallmark artists create sparkling designs scaled to every size box imaginable. There are tiny Christmas patterns for small boxes, bold patterns for the largest gifts of all, and Hallmark tags and seals in exactly the same styles as the papers you select. So why not give your gifts that extra just for you, touch of thoughtfulness which means so much. Just look for the hallmark on the gift wraps at your favorite store. It means you cared enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Yeah, yeah, Frank. You know, there is an art in giving. It's not the size of a gift or its cost, but the way it's presented and the thoughtfulness that prompts the giving. And I certainly agree that those handsome Hallmark gift wraps would make the smallest, the most inexpensive gift will look fit for a king. You know, Frank, as I listen to you talk about Christmas and, and all the pleasure we get out of sharing the Christmas spirit with others, well, I am already starting to get my feeling for Thanksgiving. <laughs> a fellow named Jeremy Taylor once said, the private and personal blessings we enjoy, the blessings of immunity, safeguard, liberty, and integrity deserve the thanksgiving of a whole life. Eh? What do you think of that? Well, now, next week we'll have a thanksgiving story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Don't we, Frank? Yes, Mr. Barrymore. We're honoring the Indian chief who played such a vital part in establishing our custom of observing Thanksgiving Day. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to tell the surprising and colorful story of how Squanto, this Indian chief, traveled to England. And so was able to greet the pilgrims in their own tongue. I uh, hope you'll all be with us next week. Remember, you're also invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television every Sunday, starring Miss Sarah Churchill. Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our script tonight was written by James Cole. William Newton Byers was played by William Johnstone. Featured in our cast tonight were Charlotte Lawrence, William Conrad, Lawrence Dobkin, Hal March, Tom Tully, and Harry Bartell. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you until next week at the same time when we present our true Thanksgiving Day story of Squanto the Cockney Indian. And the following week, we'll tell you a little-known incident about Benjamin Franklin. And the week after that, the actual story of Major Charles Yeager and his flight through the sound barrier on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.